It keeps coming back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, is there any prayer requests before we begin? Unspoken. Unspoken, yes. Unspoken, brother. Unspoken as well, yes. Unspoken. Yes. And let's remember Brother John Crothers as well as this time, and there may be others that would have a need of prayer. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee, we thank You, Lord, that we come, be, come before Thee, Lord. Lord, we realize we are not worthy, but through Jesus Christ, Lord, through Thy precious blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that You have made us worthy, Lord. And Lord, You've seen this moment, You've seen this service. Lord, you've seen all the prayer requests that's gone before thee, Lord. Whether spoken or unspoken, Lord, they're all known unto thee. And now, Lord, we commit the service in your hands. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Michael to come lead us in a song service. I think it's 125 in the blue book.
105 in the, in the same book. That one's in G. <laughs> As the world looks upon me as I struggle along, they say I have nothing, but they are so wrong in my heart. How I
thank you.
song's not in the songbook, but I'd like to sing it anyway. <laughs> I don't think it's in the songbook. <clears throat> D. When Jesus walked up that hill called Golgotha, no one really knew what was on his mind. They have a number 22 in the red book (laughs) 
Sister Linda, do you have a song? Praise the Lord. The, ch ch the chimes of time ring out the news another
Sides were locked in the jail. It was a long about midnight. The Holy Spirit prevailed. Well, the earth started shaking. They began to sing. Prison doors broke open. And the feet were free. Give it 
Sing with Jana. Thank you, Thank you. 
I actually have a testimony. Thank you, Laura. Um, I wanted to testify about uh, the miracle of God yes. and how he has um, intervened in Brandon and Mai's life um, over the last year or, or more. Um, uh, of course, we, we gave, or I gave birth to our little girl on October 6th, and uh, Brandon and I had been trying for four years before that, and uh, it was certainly a roller coaster of emotions, trying to keep faith that God would, would have his will. That's all we wanted. Um, and of course, we went, after a couple of years of trying, we went to the doctors and had tests done, and and uh, we discovered, well, we knew beforehand that there were some things going against us, but we discovered that there was more going against us and the odds certainly weren't with us. Um, and it really seemed hopeless, um, but God truly intervened. Um, in so much so that my, my specialist, my OBGYN, actually recommended that we try to conceive another way. Um, which we had thought of, and we, we looked into it and had a consult and um, more tests done. And uh, we actually felt like we needed to make a decision by March of this year because uh, we weren't sure if we needed to pay uh, another consult fee if we were actually going to go through with it. Um, and we really didn't know what to do because it costs so much money to do this. Um, last year, Brandon built me uh, a prayer room a war room, I called it, <laughs> and um, in our spare bedroom. It was a little, like a part of the room, and it had a nice little chair in there, and it was just so cozy, and um, we prayed about our troubles, of course, and um, our desire to have a child. And uh, before we had to make a decision by March this year, we actually got pregnant. And it was such a miracle, and we knew that. And um, we went up to for prayer when Brother Mims was here. I can't remember last year, maybe. Um, and I know I already testified about this, but he he told me not to fear. And I didn't. I don't think I even told him what I was praying for. But he said, "Don't fear." And I thought that was so funny that he would say that. And then I really thought about it, and I realized that I had so much fear so much fear about having a child, about delivery, about everything, and I'm going to actually list my fears because there were so many, and I need you to know how God intervened through them all. Um, I knew that from the beginning uh, my pregnancy was going to be an at-risk pregnancy um, because I have ulcerative colitis, because I'm on medication, and because of my age. Um, my fear was, did I have the energy to have a baby? Um, would I be a good mother? We have such a small house. I was fearful of delivery. Um, I had knee surgery a few years ago, and, and that was still bothering me. Sometimes it would flare up. Um, my back was terrible for years, and I had actually just finished going through nine months of pain um, starting March of last year, and I was wondering if I ever got pregnant, how that would go with my back. Um, my ulcerative colitis has been in remission for nine years, and uh, the specialist actually told me if I got pregnant, I would either flare up during pregnancy or flare up after pregnancy. Um, that's how much trauma is kind of on your body when you're pregnant. And then, of course, medication I've been on uh, to keep me in remission with my ulcerative colitis. There was uh, risks of deformations in, in my child. that They weren't high risk, but there was a possibility. Um, and I just have to say that I had the most wonderful pregnancy. I didn't even have high blood pressure, diabetes, nothing. And I slept great the whole time. <laughs> Um, the Lord just completely intervened. My back was perfect. It never bothered me at all while I was pregnant. My knee was perfect. My ulcerative colitis um, didn't even, I felt great the whole time. And it's five weeks after I get delivered and I'm still feeling great. And I praise God for that. Um, I, my fear of delivery, my delivery was wonderful. Um, there was actually the scare of having a C-section because she was coming down kind of the wrong way. Um, but this nurse, the shift changed, and this nurse came in, and she said, we're not having a C-section today, Jana. And I said, okay. 
and uh, she managed somehow to turn the baby and I delivered naturally and I'm just thankful for that. Um, the doctor actually called the OR to let them know that there would probably be a C-section that night. Um, another thing that was going against us was I only had one artery in my umbilical cord. Uh, there's supposed to be two, and the risks of that is that the baby won't grow properly or possible deformations again, um, development issues in the organs. But every time I went for an ultrasound, they were just so pleased that everything was going beautifully. She was growing, and I gave birth to a nine-pound, two-ounce baby that was 22 and a half inches long. Um, so I know God was in that. He just intervened the whole way. Um, and everyone has been so supportive. My friends, my family, my husband, um, even my colleagues were so excited. They just had to have a gender reveal cake. And um, Brandon uh, actually had, like, I didn't know if Brandon would have time off even. This is another way God <laughs> intervened. Time off to be with me and the baby at first. Um, but uh, he, he had booked it way back in April to start his vacation on October 10th for three weeks. And we were actually due on the 4th. And um, I gave birth on the 6th, the Friday. The Monday was Thanksgiving. And then he had time off after that. So God even intervened that way that he was able to be there with me for three weeks and help me. Um, and it's just such a miracle. And uh, I just praise God that my prayer room has now been converted to be replaced with my little girl's crib. So it's just such a blessing. It's just blessing after blessing. I just felt I needed to really testify about this. And we're just praying that we can bring up our daughter to be a light in this world and to serve the Lord because there's nothing better, nothing more satisfying. And even though we don't merit any grace whatsoever or anything, um, he just intervenes and he just blesses us over and over again. I'm just so thankful.
we stand, we change the order of the sermon. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you happy? Are you content? And you uh, are you willing to soldier on for the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come at this time, Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray, Lord, that you would have your way, Lord, in every part, Lord, and that, Lord, that you would use this vessel of clay as you would see fit this morning. For ask it now in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Can you see it this morning? I'm thankful that the Lord has, in the hour that we live in, has opened up things that we can see where we're going with, where we're headed for. But if there's anything that, let's say, because we're getting nearer and nearer to the end, because one day we'll be on the doorstep of the miracle war. And I pray no one has fear in their heart that they're not walking the way they ought to. But what removes the fear is having the revelated Word of God because it says love casts out all fear. That's not the love for your neighbor or your brother or your sister, but the love for the Word of God. And once you have a true revelation in your bosom, then you know where you're standing and you don't have to ask Brother so and so, do you think I'm walking the right way? Do you think this is right? Or, or maybe if I talk to this group here, it, it might be right. No, it don't work that way. It's on an individual salvational base that you and I get to know that what truth is and that we are knowing that the Holy Spirit that's in us has guided us, has shown us where we are in time. And it's wonderful to know the things that we've seen in the last year or so about the time of the end. But there is also a part in as we arriving to that time. Yes, we need to know. And it is the hour. It's the eagle age that God has led us thus far, even beyond 2004. But the whole thing is, that's wonderful to have that revelatory garment, that fine linen being put on. And that fine linen was not just done in 1963, neither in 2004. There's still, what is that fine linen? It's what God is dressing us with a revelation. But that's just a garment that we as bride put on through the means of the Holy Spirit. All right? But then there's the part of the inner man. And the part of the inner man, you don't put that on 
yourself in the sense of putting it on. In the Word of God, well, first of all, before we get to that place, we know that in the time we're living in, there's been three watches. You can call it the Eagle Age. You can call it the Third Pole. But it is God fulfilling, bringing on ground the scripture in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, where he talks about that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And that's all and wonderful. But the life has to be there with it. And for the life to be with it, there are requirements for you and I as being children of God. Now remember, that fine linen is something that God gives his revelated word that the bride has been putting on. Now, when I say that, yes, when it comes to the whole grace age, the bride will have as a, as a, the bride as a whole multitude of people that are in the bride will make that bride, she'll be fully garment, fully dressed. But that white linen that we're putting on, each generation, by putting on the word that comes in your day and your time, we need to put that on. If we not put it on, just the attri- putting, uh, working on the attributes and the characteristic of Jesus Christ in your being will not bring you to that finish line either. One without the other will not work. And this morning, I know we've been a lot on, on the book of Revelation, but I'm going to look at more now what's happening to the inner person that you and I are. First of all, how many know what needs to be cultivated into each one of us? You don't know? Okay, I don't mean to ask it that way. But if you turn to me to, with me this morning to Galatians, chapter 5. Now we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is not your revelatory garment. That's what's the inner person that you and I are, that God has called us, we have been born again, and we are like babes in Christ when He first picks us up. Thank you, brother. And we can be thankful that he did pick us up. Because we can go back to the days when God first called us. Our experience, how he brought us to himself, varies as our faces vary. But nevertheless, there's something real that took place in your and my life when God pulled. But then when he pulled you there, he wasn't just going to leave us as a babe in Christ. He wanted some growth. And throughout the whole scripture in the New Testament, there's growth, there's growing, there's putting on, there's talents, there's pounds to put on, there's the, the sowing of seed that's going to produce 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. All these things shows God is looking at an increase. When he picks something up, he just doesn't say, well, you're saved now, that's all you need. You just be happy and content where you're at and and everything's okay. No, it's going to be a lifetime walking with the Lord, and especially when it comes to the attributes and the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And those things are cultivated over time. And as we look at Galatians chapter 5 this morning, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
gentleness, goodness, faith, meek, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, each one of those fruits of the Spirit, all the potential of it is there when you and I are born again. But they're not developed. It's just like a child, and we have some very small children. They don't know everything. They have not grown in their charactership as they should, as they, what is potential for them. But over time, nurturing, as the parent nurtures that child, he will grow and teaching things how to, that he should behave and so forth in society. While God is looking in, in the same kind of a manner as he picks us up, all those potentials of those fruits of the Spirit are there, but they're there to be developed over time, and that's the way it's going to be developed. It's through trials, tests, and things that you and I go through. And depending on your growth of these things, I know it's in here somewhere. Okay, uh, oh, this one will do. The speed or the amount of that growth. First of all, we need some understanding. Yes, those growth, we must have those fruit of the Spirit. And one thing the Scripture teaches us, we're going to be like Jesus Christ, but you won't be Jesus Christ. And if I'm a 30-fold, I, will come, I can only come to that potential of 30-folds in the fruits of the Spirit. It's not like in the world, if I work harder, I'll, I'll, I'll progress faster. No, you don't. It's not done that way. It's by how the leadership of the Holy Ghost how he allows things in our lives that we're going to develop these characters or these fruits of the Spirit in your and my life. Now the love. The first love of the fruit of the Spirit is charity. And charity is not something you give money to the poor. Like I remember... Being in the Catholic Church, they talk about charity as giving money to somebody. But that's not the charity that God's talking about. He's talking about His divine love. And His divine love, God, He says, If you love me, keep my words and keep my commandments. So as the Word of God would come, whether it is in how we should live, walk, and behave here on this earth, that somewhere we have to to listen to that Holy Spirit that's in us as He wants us to teach us through examples, through trials and tests as we go down through this life road. And if we're just walking along nonchalant, not caring, your growth is not going to be very quick. Oh, I may be so attentive here in the service, wanting to be so holy. But what happens when you go at home? Where's the remote? I don't need to spend time with God. I just, I want to see my pleasure. Oh, let's go here and there. Let's go. Oh, I've got this and that to do. Well, we can't go to the service tonight because, well, I've got so many things to do. If you were on the brink of God taking you home, would that matter to you? Really? Didn't he say not forsaking the assembling yourself? And now I'm going to say that and there'll be hardly nobody here tonight. <laughs> but it's true. Why do we have to assemble? This assembling as we and I come in contact with one another as a body. God's going to work out all the kinks here on earth before we go to that millennium. Well, I don't like the way he looked at me. There must be something wrong. 
That means there needs to be a growth on my part, not to prejudge the situation. Wait till it's proper time. And us Gentiles are so prone to jump the gun. I, I have that problem too. Somebody on the road cuts me off and I'll let you know. That person, I know where the horn is. Yes, but sometimes it's God. Now, so we look at that, oh, that, that just troubles me. But we should look at it. What is God trying to teach us? If he's going to mold something that's negative, he has to bring that negative to your eyes so you can see it. And then it's up to you or I to, what are we going to do with it? And if we want to grow, then, then we have to leave it to the Lord and somehow has to die whatever the things, whatever thing that plagues us to bring that in, its, in subjection in place. That's what I meant by cultivating these attributes of the Spirit. Joy. Everybody wants to be happy. Oh my, we had a wonderful service. The, the, the singing was great and oh, everything was just fine. The Spirit was just moving. I, I want to come to those service. But sometimes God just holds back His Spirit. Well, I don't know if I'm going to come next Sunday now. Because, well, it was so flat this Sunday. It might have been flat to you. But if we're going to work as a body, what do you think how we're going to operate in the millennium? Are you going to pick and choose the person you want to work with in the millennium? In the body of Christ? Well, I want to work with Brother Branham. I want to work with Brother Jackson. Oh, I want to work with Brother Paul. You're going to work with whoever God puts you in the milieu, in the situation where you're at in that millennium. And in order to be there, we have learned something here on the earth that we can relate in order to help those millennium subjects. Because did you know that you're going to work in that millennium? Because we're going to have to teach the world nations not to war anymore. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. That's not because they're physically sick. That's because they have mentally something wrong in them that has to be brought out of them. And if we're talking about emotions, we got to get the emotions under control. And if I wear my emotions on my sleeves, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Then I need to have that under control in the millennium. Well, I didn't like how that millennium subject told me back when I told him what I, he's supposed to be doing. I'm hurt. We have to learn to die to certain things that you and I are going through. Remember, those things are not in your body, in your flesh that has to be worked out. It's in your soul. Now, I don't know where I'm going with this too much this morning. with just a few little, little thoughts, but I'm just looking at it. Because it's time to really, to look at, it's wonderful, see, it's time to look at what we need as our inner person has to grow into. But then again, I want to, don't put it so high, so it's so hard on people that, oh, they're just panicking. Remember, I may be a 30-fold. But if I'm doing all that I can within the means within there, and if I am attentive to the Lord when things come my way, to see His will in it, it will do the work of these characteristics, whether it is peace, joy, long-suffering. Oh my, long-suffering. In this day of the, that we live in now, we want things instant. So not tomorrow, now. Yeah, I'll go in and I'll need what I want, or uh, I'll go down and get myself a burger because I just feel that I've got to go now. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to get a burger. And it's not that point I'm getting. I'm, it's the emotion part that we have to bring under control. 
Look at society today. It's gone wild and loose. They want freedom. Well, the child of God wants freedom in the Lord, while well, they want freedom to sin. That's the freedom they want in this world. Don't accuse me of anything because I've got rights. Yes? But you'll have to suffer the consequences. You're free to choose what you want. But you're not free of the consequences that God is holding in, in reserve. That's... And sometimes we don't see that before our eyes. We only see what the immediate thing that's before us. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Now faith, I remember in the, before I was saved, they saying, saying so many rosary on the beads and whatnot and having praying to Mary that you might get a miracle and you, 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 you might not be crippled. That's blind faith. Faith is something that's revealed to you. Faith is the word of God, yes. All the Bible is the word of God. But if for it to be real and active... He that wrote that word is he that will prompt it in you to make it real. When we talk about the blood of Jesus Christ avails for our sins of unbelief. You can go to any denominational church, independent, evangelical church. We believe that. Yes, by this. But is it here? That God made it real. That you and I can't save ourselves. That Jesus paid the price. And here we hear the words, but sometimes we, it, it sort of like goes out of mind when we walk in the week. Jesus paid the price. He's our righteousness. And his blood will avail for you and I for our walk. What does it avail for? Your unbelieving part that you do not know or think you got wrong as far as concerning the word of God is concerned. If I don't know something, yes, God still holds that in unbelief even though I don't know. You take a, a sinner out in the world, he don't know nothing about God, but yet it's still there hanging over him. But you and I have the blood hanging over us because we believe what he said. You are not saved just on the merits how many good things you do like the Catholic Church taught or still teaches. Now they're changing their, their traditions in order for all everything come together. And we can see it coming together more and more. And since Halloween, last Halloween, when they signed that declaration that Martha, of Martha Luther that just shall live by faith, they reworded it so it's acceptable to the Catholic Church and all the denominational churches together. Headship of those churches are coming together. Maybe there are still people in their assembly. No, no, we're, we're, we're still Baptists, we're still Methodists, we're still Pentecostals. But your headship is betraying you. They're coming back to Rome. All right. So are we, do we have a concern or is, I only think about the growth of my soul while I'm here at church on Sunday? No. No, it shouldn't be. And I'm no better than you are. There's, there's, when the week starts, wow. Yes, there's things we have to do. Things you have to work out and st things like that. But there should be some time or as things would come across our path that we should look at it from the point of view, Lord, what are you wanting to work in me? And what does it mean dying to something? Well, I don't know if I want to go there. 
it, it's Sunday night, and well, I got there's a good show on. Maybe you know, I don't. I feel tired. I don't need to go. Now, I'm not trying to push that side of things, but I'm just using that as an example. We're giving in to our feelings because we ought to know what is required of us. Oh, but God will forgive. God's forgive. God's, for, God's full of grace and mercy. Yes, He is. But He's also looking at your and my growth. He's not looking for babes in Christ to be raptured. He's looking. If there's ever a time that the bride needs to come into her full growth in their inner person, is now. This is the last generation. There ain't going to be another one because when that seventh seal is broke, it is over. The only thing is in this hour, there's so much corruption and things in the world to take you away from it. More so than it was, not like it was in the early church. In the early church, there was only those false teachers that would come around. Yes, they had their difficulties in their day, living by, uh, to make an existence and so forth, and your life could be on the line. But is your life on the line today? To them, that was the pressure for them to walk with the Lord. But the pressure in you and I in this hour is that lukewarm spirit. It's betraying a lot of Christians. We just put it aside, but Lord, forgive up. Oh, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord because I have a revelation. I'm sorry, that's not the only requirement. So therefore, there is that part. Yes, we must not neglect those attributes and characteristics of Jesus Christ. You'll find it again in First Peter chapter uh, one, verse one to six, as, as well. Again, maybe I should put them up there. According to his divine power has given us unto us all things that pertains unto life and goodness. He's given it us, but it's not as if, oh, you got it. He said he given it to me. These things that's going to have to be cultivated, he's provided everything necessary for you and I to have all these good things put into us. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to his glo glory and virtue. That's in Peter. Sorry. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Co uh, verse 4. Whereby he has given us exceeding great and precious promises. Now why would the apostle Peter say they're great and precious? Are they worth $10,000? A million? Is that the value? It has no worldly value as far as that is concerned. It's value for to live in eternity for your soul. And that is the most precious thing that can be afforded for you and I to grow to be what God wants us to be. There's no other means or sources that you can to have something so precious that is there to mold us. But with our, when we look with our physical eyes, we don't see the value. But if we sense the Spirit of God, that is the most precious means for you and I to be what God requires us to be full grown with. Exceeding great and precious promises that by these... We might be partakers of the divine natures. Partakers, that we might be partakers. What do you mean by might be by partakers? Because you have to partake to cultivate in the growth of those fruits of the Spirit and those things concerning the inner man. But we have to partake. 
It's not boom, it's given to you. Now the blood of Jesus Christ is imputed to you by faith. But these other things are not imputed to you. You know what I mean by imputed? Given, like a gift. Here, there it is. It's yours. It's yours for the taking to use it to grow with to be in a place where you and I need to be. Well, praise the Lord. Having partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The inner man lust. No, 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 no. Just take your ease. Oh, I had a hamburger. I ain't going to mention a store. Maybe I'll need two. Or, well, maybe a third one. Lusting for the natural things. And that's why I, I put on so much weight. Or I have certain diseases. Now, I'm not preaching dietary situation. I'm just using an example. We can lust after things. We can lust after worldly music. Play it just as much as the, as the uh, gospel songs are. I mean, uh, that's what I'm trying to portray here this morning. So we have to differentiate. If we don't care and don't look, you will never differentiate between the two. Or you just don't care about the two. Am I speaking to... I'm speaking to me too. So we need to wake up and not fall asleep on what has been provided to us that we have to be partakers, not observers of the precious things. And besides this, giving... Well, just, you know, think about it once in a while. What does it mean, giving all diligence? Putting an effort. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Sunday, I, I'm all enthused. Now I'm going to put the effort. Come Wednesday, well, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> back to the old grind. It's easily said what I'm saying this morning, but this is work. When the Bible says, work out your salvation, it's a W-O-R-K. Work. Oh, but God loves me. I just want it through love and just walk on through. You'll never grow in those attributes. Because that old nature has to be changed. giving all diligence. Add to your faith. How do you add to your faith? That's part of their being cultivating those fruits of the Spirit that come through these avenues, through faith, virtue, and knowledge. Now, knowledge is not... Now, in today's world, boy, knowledge is the great thing. Knowledge everywhere. There's things that's been so that we've learned that man has come into knowledge of great, wonderful things that are taking place. Just knowing it is not enough. But when it comes to knowledge, it's the knowledge of things of God, not just because you heard it with the with the brain, but you heard it with the spirit, and you have that knowledge in you and you believe it. And knowledge in this hour, what hour are we living in in this time period now? Yes, we're in that third watch. Whether you be in the first watch, second watch, or the third watch, you're under that eagle spirit. And what is the gift predominantly since 1963? It's the gift of knowledge of God opening up His Word, which entails visions, dreams, and inspiration of His Word that's being opened up. That's the hour we're living in. Oh, but I like it when the 50s, when, when God was so wonderful doing miracles and healing people, and I could see all these things, wonderful as they were. Beautiful. 
but there's no growth. So God has changed. He used that to attract people with. Great gifts, healing, faith, and so forth. That's during the 50s through the ministry of Brother Branham when he was, before he started preaching on the seals. But when that came to 1963, now God changed the order of it. It's the gift of knowledge has been predominant, especially in that second watch under that ministry of the apostle. And it didn't die in 2004. It's still existing today. The eagle didn't say, well, I've got my job done. I'm going to fly home. And they're on their way. They're just waiting for the miracle war now. And the opening of the seventh seal. My foot. Well, praise the Lord. You still happy? These are rare times in which I'll touch that area of things. But... I felt a concern some in this morning. Are we looking at those attributes that's in us? Ever since... 1963. During the 19th century, as God has restored water baptism, being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the operations of some gifts, by the time you hit 1963, God used that prophet to restore every revelation that the apostles doctrines they had and from 1963 till now by when we reach 2018 will be 55 years that those doctrines have been restored just to Look at in the terms of of the doctrines of the apostle and just playing there. Yes, it can be used if people are paying heed to it that they can grow in the inner man. But if that's all they've been that you want to minister, then you're not growing you're not putting this on. And God has been revealing things since 1963. Up to 2004, great. And even to 2018, or we're about ready to enter in 2018. Yes, we've been more looking in this assembly here than here. But if perfection entails in the doctrines of the apostles... Then after 54 years of it being on ground, that person should have come to perfection by now. If that's all the perfection entails. But there's two parts to being made ready. There's the inner person. And then there's a revelation that we have to put on. You have to cultivate the attributes of the spirit. You've got to put those work, those things to cultivate to be in you. But the revelation of the Word of God, you don't cultivate it. You put it on by believing the truth. And the blood of Jesus Christ that I spoke earlier, it covers you and I for every unbelief. But when the Word of God comes on ground, we are fa- the true child knows and sees truth. So he's covered by the blood. But those that reject it are not covered for that part as they walk on. So we're living between, where are we living? Are we living just to get this right and not concerned with this part? Or are we just concerned with the, just putting on the fine linen, just putting on revelation without the inner man being made ready? Both are important, 
by the time that seventh seal is broke. I can't stress it. How long do we have till that seventh seal is going to, is going to be broke? I was watching TV. You say you watch TV? Yeah. I seen on the news concerning the World War II veterans. They were a million strong. That came out after the war. And now they're what? Maybe 15,000 or 100,000 left. And most of them are from the mid '90s, and they were interviewing two of them that they only two that they could really get to that could talk, and one, two, and three of them. And two of them was in wheelchair, and the the other one was 99. He was still had his mind active, but he's 99 years old. Another five years. How many will reach 100? That generation cannot be the ministry that's going to be finishing this out. So when we look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, when you see the fig tree put forth a branch, yes, that was 1948. But when it put forth a branch, Jesus said two things in there. I don't know if I have it here or not. Yeah, okay, let's do anyway. It had a branch. And I know I'm repeating some things in the sense that, yes, in the days of Brother Branham, that when that fig tree would happen, that generation would not pass and would do all things fulfill. Now, a generation in Psalms, I believe it's 92 or, ni- or Psalms 90. That the life of a man is three score and ten, seventy years, and by the reason of strength, four score, eighty years. That's a generation. That's the definition of a generation. It's there in the scripture. So therefore, we have to look at our attention. What did Jesus mean by Matthew twenty-four? Did he mean when the fig tree would start, when it start to put forth its branch? He all, he said two things in that verse. As he starts, when you see the fig tree puts forth another branch, a bud, and put forth leaves, that generation will not pass away till all things fulfill. And when we look at 1948, it was a scriptural, you could go to Isaiah and see it being fulfilled. And so you can't just look at all oh, leaves, that's somewhere later on, because leaves only comes after a tree has put out the branch far enough and it starts to grow. Well, the leaves means people. And in 1967, you just can't take the leaves, well, okay, it's 48, may, it might be, I don't know, 1960, maybe 70, 80, no. It has to be tied to a prophetic event. And in 1967, fulfill the words of Jesus of Luke chapter 21 speaking about Jerusalem will no longer be occupied by the times of the Gentiles the time is over that's fine that is scriptural that took place we know because it happened we can attach a date to it but it is a scriptural event and so what did that yes well yes Israel took Jerusalem but they also took land which means now more leaves can be put into the nation of Israel And I believe it's that generation will live long enough to see all things fulfilled. You and I are that generation. I know some don't like to hear about dates and so forth, but somewheres you can't look into oblivion. Well, it's somewheres out there. We're just waiting for a war. We're just waiting for... They... When Jesus said to watch, he says, watching scriptural things that would point to his coming. When the Lord opened up in this hour that season, times and seasons, it was not for them to know, but it's for us to know. 
And we know that times meant centuries, seasons meant, meant decades. While the fact that, yes, 1948, when that came about, there will never be another 100 years. Times is over. In the days when they was, Jesus spoke about it, they didn't talk about centuries and decades. They talked about times and seasons. But in today's language, that's what it is. And so therefore, if there would be no more 100 years to go, then somewhere in that less than 100 years would have to be everything being fulfilled. And then when he talks about that generation, now we're looking at 1967. And from 67 to 2017, we have gone five seasons or five decades. That's 50 years. The lifespan of a man is 70. And by reason of strength, he can be 80. So somewhere in the next few years, we ought to see that miracle war. That is watching, gives us more information how close we are getting to the Lord's coming. And it's not, well, nobody knows. Yes, somebody knows about the time frame that we're getting near. And if we're getting that near, that's why I'm looking at this morning, how are we being made ready? I hope we don't do like we were going to school, like some of us did. We go to school all year, and then we didn't do much, and then we cram for the exam, trying to pass. I hope we're not trying to cram to get ready for the Lord's coming. Because putting on these attributes and these characteristics and these attributes, you don't do that in one year. Unless you're going to suffer terribly. If you didn't get it in, in 20, 30 years, you ain't going to get it in one more year. So it should have been a, uh, an ongoing thing of cultivating those attributes and those characteristics of the fruits of the Spirit for the inner man. But at the same time, we had to be putting on revelation to knowing how we're going to get near to the Lord's coming. Now remember, watchmen... The fivefold ministry is supposed to be watchmen. They're supposed to be watches. They're supposed to watch. Not watch just for the doctrine of the apostle, but they should be watching for every move, whether you lived in this hour here in the days of Brother Branham, or in the days of Brother Jackson, or even in this hour. And if we're staying back there, with only that revelation that was brought to 2004 then that generation will fare no better than those that were under the Brother Branham's. When I read Ezekiel, and I know he was told to go tell the people, he says, he's not sending them to a people that's hard of speech and not knowing what should be going on. God says, I'll send, I'm sending you to there as a watchman to tell them. But God says, these are stiff-necked and rebellious. Who rebelled when Brother Brandon came on the scene? Your, your denominational churches, didn't they? Who rebelled when Brother Jackson or the Apostle came on the scene? It was those of the Brandon move. And I can see the same thing happening now. Who's rebelling now? against what God's bringing on ground. Now it's time to look at the, at the truth. No more than they want to accept what Ezekiel was saying. And, and there too, he said, well, nobody listens to him, his message. He was discouraged. So was Jeremiah. Well, look what happened here. Look what happened here. Look what happened in Luther's day when the, or when Wesley came along. They hardened their hearts and thought they were safe in what they, they, what they previously was taught. While under tutorship, 
Look at it, whatever ministry you want to, or period of time, it's there. Under that time that, let's say, a, a group of people within a certain realm where God has a servant on ground, as they're under tutorship, it would draw people, not draw large crowds, but yes, in the, when, when the gifts were operating in Brother Branham's day, but aside from that, it drew people that had a revelation and there were other people that had an intellectual understanding. Same revelation. They could speak on the same terms. And so the only way that you're going to find out is when Jesus said, let them grow. Yes, he's using the grace age. But let every generation grow when they have to step on the scene and now be the, the front line that God wants to use. That's where you know what they're like. By their fruits you shall know them. So what are we, the inner man is to be changed. It's not the spirit that changed. You are born but one time. You have whatever measure the Holy Ghost has given you while you're here on earth. Yes, we have a down payment. We'll have the full measure when you get your resurrected body, but that's not now. But now as we are, yes, born again, We need to grow. We need to move forward. And it is God that moves us on towards perfection. Now perfection, before I came to this message or when I first came in perfection, oh, that's somebody who can't make a mistake. That's the world's definition of perfection. It means complete. And perfection can be in this way here. If a 30-fold comes into his full 30-fold, he is perfect for his 30-fold. A 100-fold comes into the level of his 100-fold, he is perfect for that measure. All right? And what is the measure that we all should be looking at to attain? We should come into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We grow into that image, which is those that divine nature is the fruit of the Spirit. And I have to say, how are we faring out? If God was going to bring a report card and mark down some things, would we wish to change things a little bit? But us Gentiles seems like where we're really under the gun and under pressure is when something comes on our doorstep like 9-11. Oh, people go searching for God then. Just like some of the testimonies I've heard of, they were, t- they were telling us some of the testimonies of some of these World War II veterans. How some prayed like they never prayed before. They carried a Bible. Some, a lot of them did. But they weren't doing that before they, went in the, they were involved in that war. Now if that miracle war comes around, it's not because we're going to, the country's going to be blown up. Well, we will see the seriousness of the time frame you and I are living in. Okay, we heard, yeah, the miracle war. There could be about three years before the Ezekiel Wars or three years. Maybe I can work it out then. I'll just delay it till then. I'll get really concerned then. Forget it. Some of these attributes that we have to cultivate is on a day-to-day basis. Well, I didn't come to hear all that. If I told you everything's fine, God loves you, just keep walking with the Lord, love one another. And that love that we express in that manner, why do you think has deceived the world? 
as Satan has done through the religious world. It's that kind of love that brings people together. Don't say anything bad. Well, sure, we ought not to say anything bad. But if that's the kind of love that we're looking at to put things together, yes, they're coming together, but they compromise on every truth. But God's not putting the bride on just the basis of love alone. Not that kind of love. It'll be on his revelated word that will bring unity. Now when you speak of that, well, people say, you're speaking against love. Well, yes, you can love a person. And yes, the love of God reaches out for our sinners and, and to help brothers and sisters and so forth. That's all well and fine. But what about the first commandment? If you love me, keep my words. Not words past tense. Because if you refuse him that's speaking from heaven, oh, we haven't refused a thing God said in the past. Well, do you know what he's saying today? That's the question. So if we, re if we say we, we're working with love and love is what's going to bring it all together and we refuse him that's speaking in this hour, that love for one another will not supersede the love that he's requiring for you and I to love him and his word that he's bringing down. How do we love him? Is there somewhere we can say, oh, Lord, I love you. I put your arms around him. Well, that's a natural way of thinking at it or looking at it. But when we say we love him, is you love his thoughts. That's loving him. But if I come to a point in life and say, well, I, I love the things you told us in the past. But I don't think, I, no, those things don't count. You, you, you fall ball in there somewhere. You're, you're off. We don't need that. Well, it's just like a person trying to, if you love a certain person, it's because you love their thoughts. You can't just love a portion of their thought. I don't know how to express it more. Than Words fail me trying to express what I'm trying to say to you this morning. If we love him, we love all his thoughts when he brings his thought on ground. He's not a God of the past. He's a God, yes, of the past, the present, and the future. But we need to love him what he is in the present. Well, must be old age getting long, long winded again. I'll have to get me one of them candies and not a button, right? So praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Yes. Sure. Yes.
testimony and I was going to give it earlier and then I didn't and um, uh, the Lord is patient sister yes well the, this week I was reading in Colossians and you know sometimes uh, I've read it many many times but sometimes the word just jumps out at you and it really spoke to my heart and it was and I was reading in an amplified Bible and it was about patience and in the Amplified, it says something to this effect that uh, patience uh, is to endure all things that come our way with a gentle temper. And I realized that many times I thought I was patient, but I just had a, an endurance. I really wasn't patient. I was just enduring until it was over. And it really spoke to my heart. And I really, really thought, well, this is really what I need. I have to be patient with a gentle temperance and not get upset about it, but be patient. Right. And so it really spoke to my heart, and um, I've been thinking about it all week. And then yesterday, we were uh, putting wood in our house, three cords in our house, and two and a half of my sisters. And we had 11 people came over to help us, which I was thankful for. And I served them all lunch, but I wasn't patient. It was very noisy, and I was frustrated, sort of. And, and then at my sister's, the same thing in the evening. She fed us, and, it went, and while we were pounding the wood, it was people of all different not believers, and the conversation was getting sort of innuendos, like sexual innuendos, and I didn't like it, and I was getting very frustrated and impatient. And I was sitting here this morning, and I realized that God put those situations for me to realize that he's trying to help me become patient. And instead of being frustrated, all of a sudden this morning, I was really thankful for those situations because he's dealing with me, and I realized, oh, he put that in my life so that I can learn to be patient. And I'm really thankful, and I know he has a lot of work to do on me, but I really see that he is working on me. And I'm really thankful. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I know I had a, last night a wonderful time with a brother and sister from Australia. We were almost two hours, so that's why maybe I'm getting that be long-winded, so. But uh, they're wonderful brothers and sisters as well, so. All right, uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, at this time. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, get us out of our sleep and our eyes upon thee, Lord, that to mold those attributes in our lives as what you saw fit, Lord, to whatever portion it be, Lord, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold for our measure. And, Lord, in the days to come, I just pray, Lord, that thy spirit would continue to work on each and one, every one of us, Lord. For I ask this now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I think it's you're ready to dismiss. All right, then you're dis. Huh? No. All right, musicians, you have some work to do. Let's just have a seat in case someone has a need this morning. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Brenda, do you have a chorus this morning? Something? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this precious day. Yes. We thank you that we're allowed to assemble ourselves together in a building where we're not oppressed. And Lord, that 
we have the freedom here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we're thankful for what we've heard this morning. It's needful, Lord. Needful for all of us, each and every one of us. Lord, I'm so thankful that you do for us what you do for us. And help keep us mindful, Lord. That Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. And Lord, I just... Any that are sick and afflicted, Lord, and there's many. There's so many. Oh, God, just give them a touch, Lord. Lord, give us traveling mercies on the highway. And those that are sick in mind, Lord, there's so many. There's just so many, Lord. Just give them strength, I ask it. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen. Thank you, Lord.